Uh, and, and good evening, uh, uh, Noreen and Geraldine. Um, I suppose when I'm, I'm reading your opening statement and I, I'm, I'm thinking, where did the idea to reconfigure what was there before PDS come from? Because right, I would have heard that it was because the, the early intervention and the child development teams were working well in some areas and not so well in others, and it was to provide an actual service across the board to everybody. But what families have said to me is, yeah, it provided equity all right, in that none of us were getting anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just wondering, like, I, I'm taking it from what you've said there that staff that worked in those teams weren't spoken to or consulted with around changing it. Because I know parents certainly weren't. I don't think they were consulted with in any form or, or, or means. Um, and, you know, I know, Julie, you just described it to Deputy Canny there what was working well. And, it, it, you know, that sounds like it should work really well where the child has been supported in its home environment and the child has been supported in the school environment. Um, but that's not happening, to my knowledge. Maybe it is in some areas, but it, it's... Um, I know I, I represent two counties of Cavan and Monaghan, mm. and we have two CDNTs, one run by Enable Ireland and one run by the HSE. And both of them have huge issues with recruitment and retention. The HSE is a slightly higher rate of, of re re recruitment and retention than, than the other. And that's probably the pay uh, disparity issue that's affecting yeah, that. It is. Yeah. But, um, but neither of them are fully staffed and neither of them providing a wonderful service. And that's not a reflection of the staff, that's a reflection mm. of the, the whole system. Um, and, you know, it, it's... <laughs> Um, and I know you talked about working in a special school, and I was actually in a special school yesterday, mm -hmm. and the, the principal there was talking about at one stage the Board of Management actually some years ago um, hired a, uh, I think it was an OT to come into the school mm -hmm. for three days, and that OT worked with children, and the, the other teachers and SNAs in the school picked up on the different um, procedures and thing, systems mm -hmm. she was using, mm -hmm. and they were able to then replicate that. And it, in, it resulted in that person only needing to be re, to be employed two days a week mm -hmm. rather than three because they were training the staff by showing them what, what was happening. Mm -hmm. And when this model was introduced, I thought it was supposed to be where families could choose to have services in their school or in at their home, and that didn't transpire. In fact, special schools lost their, mm -hmm. their therapists. Um, there was no risk assessment carried out. There were parents very concerned, you know, with children with very complex needs. They were really concerned there was no risk assessment carried out. Um, and we need to see where the, where, where the services go back into the schools, though I believe there's um, a disagreement between the Department of Education and, and the Department of Disability on that. But um, there was a school inclusion model that was piloted in CHO7, where therapists went into the schools and like that worked with the staff within mainstream schools. Mm. And what I've been told by the NCSE is where that was done, the requirements of the CDNT reduced dramatically. Mm. So I think we need to see a system that's joined up between mm. education and the Department of Children and Disability, etc., where we have uh, clinicians and uh, therapists working in the school, but also providing where required therapy in the community. But at the moment, it's disjointed. Absolutely. And we have parents looking for assessments for children, not necessarily to get services, but to get a school place. Mm. Yeah. So th the pressure's coming there from the school as well, that they're, they say, well, we don't have enough places for our children with additional needs, so we need to determine who gets one, so you mm. need an assessment. And then you know the assessment is done, and you know I know uh, the minister may have said that parents can now um, get a private assessment and have it paid for. Mm -hmm. But I'm concerned there. I don't think the capacity is in the private sector at the moment to actually yep. address that. And yep. um, I think it might encourage more people to move from the public to the private mm -hmm. sector. Um, there's, we have unregulated psychologists there still. Mm. That's mm. you know, so there's a there's a lot of problems with that as well. Mm. So I know because I, 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 yeah, I know you've, you've addressed an awful lot of issues here this evening, and a lot of them were, were the issues there. But I suppose I'm wondering, like, where the model actually came from? Are there are you aware of international models that you know, like other countries that are doing something that maybe could work here, um, and um, you know, like. Do we need to have it more school-based? Like, I'm of the opinion maybe that is the way to go, that we 
we're not doing away with the teams and the community, but that they're linked in much more strongly with the school, especially special schools, but also with mainstream schools, especially if they have a, a unit or a special class. Yeah, you've made a, a number of really important uh, points there. Um, there are NIP psychologists who operate in schools. There's no reason that there could not be um, NIPs OTs and NIPs uh, SLTs um, working within the school system and joined up um, um, then, you know, for consults with the, the local um, CDNTs. Um, at the moment, the CDNTs are trying to fill the gaps in all areas. So definitely, there, there could be CD, um, MDT members working in 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 the school set up under under NEPS. Um, it's lovely to hear the story about the OT coming in for privately for three days and then only needing two days. Yeah. That, that was upskilled. My question to you then would be, what will happen next year when that teacher goes on maternity leave or go, decides to go to travel? Have you to go back and start? So what I mentioned earlier on about the, the, the fundamental um, upskilling of um, teachers, and I know, you know, it's a really... Um, intensive program to you know to to uh, train a teacher and we're not saying that that uh, you know special needs can be incorporated into that even though I think it's 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 a very small component um, of their training is special education even though that they might be working in, in that area so that that needs to be looked at um, to bring the, the teachers to a level where that year on year you don't have to go back in and you know retrain the teacher yeah. to, to take on that they're operating at that level where they they can then link with the the, the cd and t um, that'd be really really um important um is there anything yeah to say? i think that 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 idea of more joined up thinking working between health and education like that was one of the fundamental goals of pds and if yeah. you look at that that initial report from 2009 that was literally one of their core objectives and it absolutely, you know, it hasn't been realised. I mean, there was a circular issued by the Department of Education quite recently saying that they, they, they're they not going to include CDNT figures in their calculations yeah. for their special education or their special education teaching hours because in effect they feel it, it's not an accurate representation, which is a very worrying development because I suppose it gives an insight into, into how the relationships between health and education are at the moment, and we really need to strengthen those. And I think you mentioned that wh why was this model set up, mm -hmm. and I think it's one of the reasons we would have been very keen to see those minutes of those initial meetings of the reference group, because we <coughs> hope that's where we might find that information. From the documents we could access, it was the a driving force seemed to be this this fact that there was a geographical inequity, a postcode lottery, that there were some pockets of the country where children were receiving quite a good <coughs> service, probably not perfect, um, we're certainly not saying that, but they were receiving a good service. Families on the whole felt they were reasonably happy. They, they felt they were better off once they were with services, that things were improving. And then there were other pockets of the country where services really, there may not have been a service provider, which I think goes back to the fact that services developed in a very ad hoc manner, some delivered by the HSE, some mm. delivered by voluntary agencies. There was, there was no coordinated development. So from what we looked into, that seems to have been the, the driving force around it, was that while we're going to, in effect, within a geographical region, we're going to pool the available resources and create services that are more geographically based so that, again, the, the aspiration being the children will be able to access their services local to themselves. And as you mentioned, there was, from the very outset, I think there was this issue around children who go to special schools, because by the nature of special schools, children come from a number of catchment areas. There was a concern of, are you going to have four or five CDNTs feeding into the one school? How will that work? And as we've, I suppose one of the concerns that, that we found in our report was that there wasn't really an evidence base put forward in the initial report for the ceasing of school-based therapies. Mm. We've now seen a period where through a lot of, I suppose, families have communicated their dissatisfaction with it. Even um, when Deputy Michal Martin was um, Taoiseach, he described it as there had been this diluting of services for children in special schools. And we're now in a place where there's been a decision to try and reinstate those services after a period of yeah. quite a lot of disruption. But again, 
we haven't actually seen, well, why is the evidence based for that now? What is different now? Then, and it's in, obviously we want families to be listened to, and certainly in terms of international models, you mentioned that there are other countries. We know that in New Zealand, the model of disability services, it is much more housed within the education system, and therapists are much more based within the schools. Now, it's, as we've said, it's not that we are saying we should take that model and just blanketly mm -hmm. roll it out in Ireland, but it may be that there is important learning from there that we could look at, well, how can we best work collaboratively between education and health where you could have that, I suppose, that cascade effect of by therapists working very closely with schools. There's that upskilling across the school and actually teachers feel more supported, potentially in conjunction with, as Geraldine was saying, more focused training for teachers and education staff yes. so that you're kind of coming at it from a few different angles. Um, I think, so it's definitely something that I think we can look at other jurisdictions, but then it is about looking at that critically yeah. and seeing what, how would that work in an Irish context, because there's always going to be specific factors that will impact how we can implement something. Yeah.